good all the time. All the time. God is good. Is my microphone on? Let's try it again. There we go. All right, here at Cathedral, nobody's perfect, starting with me. Oh, it's great to see everybody stand with me, please. It's so good to have you out. Thank you for joining us. All those who are on site and those who are watching online, thank you, thank you, thank you. We've been looking all this month at a man who's on fire, a prophet by the name of Elijah. And before we jump into the word today, I'd like us to pray. Father, thank you for all of these Wonderful folks who have created space in their calendars to come and meet you in this moment to give you thanks. If that's all we did, was to come to church and give you thanks, that would be enough because you're a good and gracious God. But I pray over these next few moments as we dive into your word that you would take your word and that you would apply it to each of our hearts that we can leave here changed because we met you in this place that we would get our fire back. And I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All God's people said, amen. Amen. Let's give God praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm getting my fire back. Say that with me. I'm getting my fire back. Before you're seated, tell somebody, I'm getting my fire back. I'm getting it back. And that really is the big idea of the message, that when your fire goes out, how do you get it back? Life could be a little bit like this fire pit. I'm going to ask Pastor Rick to help me out. How about a big hand for Pastor Rick? He does such a great job. And so, uh, during the winter, there's nothing like getting around a fireplace. I love it. You get around a fireplace, you get it really cranking, and that flame gets high, and look at that. Wow, it gets warm, and you can feel the heat, and does anybody have some marshmallows? (laughs) And you're enjoying the fire pit with your buddies, and you're laughing, and And then, if you sit there long enough, well, that fire starts to get lower and lower and lower, and at some point, that fire goes out. And that right there is what we're going to talk about today. What do you do when the fire goes out? Because all of us know what it is to feel low, and discouraged and depressed for that fire to go out. I saw a dog, he looked depressed. And then I saw this monkey, he looked depressed. And then I saw this kid, he looked depressed too. And that right there is what Elijah was feeling. How are you feeling this morning? Is that flame really high? Or is that flame very low? You may have come through these doors one way, but I believe by the power of God and the grace of God, you're going to leave them a different way. You're going to leave here. I've got my fire back. Say it with me. I've got my fire back. Thank you, Pastor Rick. Give Pastor Rick another hand. Yeah. So today, Elijah the prophet, he is really low. He is down and depressed. So down and depressed, he doesn't want to be a prophet anymore. He doesn't want to be in ministry anymore. In fact, he doesn't want to do life anymore. Look at what he says in 1 Kings 19.4. He says, the Bible says that Elijah sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. Elijah prayed that he might die? He prayed that he might die. I have had enough. You ever felt like that? (laughs) I've just had enough, Lord. He said, take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. What do you do 
when the fire goes out. Now, the thing that's interesting about this moment is this Elijah is feeling really low, but not long ago, he was feeling really high, like the 49ers. He had just experienced a major victory. He had gone toe to toe with 450 prophets of Baal. And unlike the 49ers, it was not even close. He put the hurts to them in front of king and country. They prayed, nothing happened. He prays, fire falls from heaven. He prays again, uh, rain falls from heaven. It was one of the highest highs in his ministry. And in the next moment, we see him facing one of his lowest lows. One of his lowest lows. When Jezebel, the wicked queen Jezebel, finds out that what had happened to those 450 prophets, well, these were her prophets. They were her homies. And so she was ticked, and she was going to do something about that Elijah. And so... She sends this message. You would think that Jezebel would have a change of heart, but instead she hardens her heart and she sends this message to Elijah. We see Jezebel says, may the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you. Wow. And so Elijah runs for his life. And then he prays for God to take his life. Isn't that something? He doesn't want Jezebel to take his life. Instead, he wants God to take his life. Your emotions, when they're engaged, can have you all over the map. That's why emotions are good servants, but they're bad masters. What do you do when the fire is low? Because most of us, even the very best of us, my dad was the most on fire person. He was our founding pastor and he was the most on fire person I've ever met in my entire life. He was amazing. Yeah, full of faith, full of fire. And yet even my dad knew what it was to feel low. In fact, he wrote a book called Overcoming Depression. And in the book, he writes, you see, Kenny Foreman knows what it is to suffer depression and to feel discouraged. My local church often sees Kenny Foreman from the external view. They observe only the preacher who comes on the platform with a spring in his step, a gleam in his eye, pure joy in his heart, and a smile on his face. One of my congregation members once said he could never, ever imagine me being discouraged. And yet, even the best of us at times, we all know what it's like to have that flame get low, to even have the fire go out. What do you do when that happens? How can you overcome discouragement? If you're taking notes, I want to give you four ideas that you can put into practice this week. The first idea involves refueling your tank. Refueling your tank. For those who for those who know how this fireplace works, there's a fuel line that connects to this fireplace, and if you follow the fuel line, it connects to a propane tank. And when that propane tank is full, that flame is high. But if that propane tank gets low, so does this flame. And when that propane tank is empty, you can crank it up. You can crank it up as high as you want, but it has nothing left to give. And that's when you got to get that, go to the store and get that tank refilled. Hello. And imagine that you have a tank inside of you, a fuel tank. And when that tank gets really low, 
Boy, that's when the fire goes down. And so that's when you have to take time to renew your spirit and renew your soul and renew your body. If you were measuring the level of how full your tank is today, where, where are you at? Are you full? Are you half full? Are you more toward the empty side? You know, when you get tired, well, we can understand now why Elijah does what he does. A famous football coach, Vince Lombardi, once said, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And so what happens is here is Elijah, and here's a man who's confident, and here's a man who's courageous in facing off against the king and 450 prophets of Baal. But then a woman puts the fear into him, and he runs away. Now, I've known some scary women. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? But you would expect Elijah to man up a bit, show a little more backbone. But instead, Jezebel says she's going to take him out. Elijah gets afraid because fatigue turns us all into cowards. And he goes, and that's when we pick up the story that he lays down, and there he needed to be refreshed. In 1 Kings 19, we read this. Then then Elijah lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, get up and eat. He looked and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones. Do you think that was angel food cake? (laughs) (laughs) And a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. God shows up and Elijah needs rest. He's spent. He's mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally exhausted. And God begins to refresh him by giving him something to eat, something to drink, and taking a nap. If you're burnt out today, and you want to take a nap during my sermon, (laughs) you have grace to do that. Amen. (laughs) Because God wants you to be refreshed, to be renewed in your spirit, your soul, and your body. Life is a little bit like, you know, if you're comfortable doing this, let's get interactive. If you'll take your, your fingers and let's snap them together. Can we all do this? All right, let's snap them at the same time. All right, you're doing good, Cathedral. I've got rhythm. Yeah, give yourself a hand. That's awesome. That is what you call rhythm. And rhythm is the way God created us to live. There's a rhythm to life. There's a rhythm to giving and receiving, to working and resting, to self-sacrifice and self-care. And if your life gets out of rhythm, and all you're doing is working and sacrificing and giving, when that tank gets empty, you've got nothing left to give. And if that's where you're at today, God wants to start to refill that tank and renew your spirit, and renew your soul, and renew your body. Amen. The Bible says, God makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. Let's give him praise. Amen. God can restore you. Give him something to work with. So, The next clue has to do with sharing your struggle. If we're gonna get back that fire, we've gotta learn to share the struggle. Because I don't know about you, but with me, when I get depressed, the last thing I feel like is being around people. If you made it to church today through the weather and you're depressed, 
boy, I'm going to give you a double shout out. Because when I'm depressed, I don't want to be around anyone. I want to go and sit on the couch and turn down the lights and get the remote in one hand and a bucket of ice cream in another hand. And I go through the ice cream uh, by myself, in isolation. I, I like, this guy said, pity party for one. Your table is now ready. Pity party for one. And that's what I like to do. I like to have my own private pity party. But here's what I've discovered. After I go through that ice cream, I don't feel better. I end up feeling worse. And that's why when you keep isolated in your struggle. One of the keys to lifting your mood is bringing your struggle into the light. This is what Elijah does. I mean, God shows up and says to Elijah, he asks him a question. He says, Elijah, what are you doing here? Do you think God knew the answer to that question? Amen. Let me ask you again. Do you think God knew the answer to that question? So, who was God asking the question for? He wasn't asking it for his sake. He was asking it for Elijah's sake. So that Elijah, Elijah would not be isolated in his struggle, but he would open up and be honest about what he was thinking and how he was feeling. Because as you share your struggle, there's something about bringing your struggle to the light that can begin to lift your mood. I read this week that... Actually, if you have insufficient lighting in your house, that it can depress your mood. And this works in more ways than one. That when you keep your struggle in the dark, just to yourself, and you're isolated, this is where the enemy of your soul likes to work. He likes to work in the dark. He plays his tricks in the dark. He works on your mind in the dark. He works on your heart in the dark. If he can keep you right here in the dark, that's what he's going to do. You didn't invite him to that pity party, but he wants to show up to that pity party because he wants you to stay there as long as he can get you to stay there because if he can keep you at that party, he can keep you from reaching the dream that God has for your life. And that is why, that is why we've got to bring our struggle into the light, because when we do, we break the power of the enemy's uh, darkness over us. We break his power, the enemy of our soul. When we bring that struggle out of the dark and into the light. Are you battling your depression and your discouragement alone? I would encourage you. Today's the day to bring it into the light. There was a, a lady by the name of Brooke Shields. She was a famous actress, and uh, she went through a severe bout with postpartum depression. And in an interview, she was talking about how she made it through it. And she said that knowing that she was not alone in her struggle was the key. She said this. She says, when I felt there was nothing I could do to help myself, knowing that I was prayed for was often the only thing that stood between me and despair. When we bring our struggle out of the dark and into the light, we're on our way to overcoming depression. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. Amen. Well, here's another idea. The third idea, if you're taking notes, is to adjust your thinking. To adjust your thinking. And this is really important. It's really important. Because we get a sense of why Elijah is so depressed when we see the way he is thinking. He answers God's question. And listen to the way he answers it. Can we bring 1 Kings 19 up? There we go. Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. We can see why he's depressed. Look at the way he's thinking. 
He's thinking that he has been a complete and miserable failure. He is thinking that he's the only one left that's loving God and serving God. And he's thinking that the wicked queen is going to take him out and do him in. No wonder he's depressed. When you think a certain way, it's going to impact the way that you feel. There was a study that was done, and in the study they found that the average person has 200 negative thoughts a day, while the depressed person averages 600 negative thoughts a day, three to one. Here's the question. Does, well, does being depressed cause you to have negative thoughts or does negative thoughts cause you to be depressed? And the answer is both are true. The more you think negatively, the more you're going to be depressed. You are. The more you're depressed, the more you're going to think negatively. And on and on, it spirals down. You get stuck in this vicious cycle until eventually you get to the point. There's a sign that reads this way. It says, I am such a pessimist. I have my blood tested and I was B negative. <laughs> we are so negative. How do we break out of the cycle? Well, the Bible says this is a key. It says, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you what? Change. The way that you what? Change. Say it loud. Say it, the cha- that you what? Change. Think. Think. You can't tell yourself to feel differently. I mean, if, you tell your, if you're depressed and you tell yourself to don't be depressed, you're going to be even more depressed because you're still depressed. But what you can do is you can tell yourself to think a different way. You can tell yourself, yes, I am feeling depressed, but I am not my depression. I may feel depressed, but I am not my depression. I am more than my depression. And I'm going to start to think a different way. Because if I start to think a different way, God can take the way that I think and change the way that I feel so I can spiral out of this depression and take back my joy, amen. That's what God wants to do. It's adjusting the way that I think. How am I thinking? I I mean, did anybody watch any football last week? Yeah? Oh, let me ask again. Did anybody watch any football last week? All right. I mean, it was a great game. The 49ers are down 24 to 7, and then they come back and they win 34 31. And what a game. And what really caught my attention, though, was uh, their quarterback, Brock Purdy. He was being interviewed afterwards, and they were talking about what he was thinking at halftime. And at halftime, I would have thought he would have been very down, very low. But look at how he was thinking. He said this. So when I'm down 17 at half, honestly, I'm just thinking, all right, God, you've taken me here, and win or lose, I'm going to glorify you. (laughs) Let me read that again. I'm just thinking, all right, God, you've taken me here, but win or lose, I am going to glorify you. (laughs) Talk about a way of thinking. That's my peace, that's the joy, that's the steadfastness, that's where I get it from, and that's the honest truth. So I leaned into that, and sure enough, we were able to come back. When in your thinking, whatever you're facing today, when in your thinking you say, either way, God, win or lose, I am going to glorify you. Talk about cycling your way out of that depression. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Either way, God, we're going to glorify you. On fire. Say it with me. On fire. I want you to take back your fire today. If you came here down and depressed, all of us get depressed. It's one thing to get depressed. It's another thing to live in depression. God wants to help you get back your fire. And so the last idea is claiming your future claiming your future. And this is such an important one. 
I love Peanuts comic strips, and there's a Peanut comic strip, and Lucy and Linus are watching television, and Lucy asks Linus, she says, go get me a glass of water. And Linus says, why should I do anything for you? You never do anything for me. And she says, well, when you're 75, I'll bake you a cake. (laughs) And then Linus goes to get the water, and he says, life is more pleasant when you have something to look forward to. (laughs) And Linus is right. Life is more present when you have something to look forward to, and that's what God gives Elijah. He gives him something to look forward to. First of all, he tells him that things weren't as bad as he thought they were. Elijah was involved in catastrophic thinking, and things were not as bad as he thought they were. That He wasn't the only one that loved and served God, that the wicked queen was not going to take him out and do him in, and that he hadn't been a total and complete miserable failure. So God adjusts his thinking, but then he gives him a mission. He gives him a purpose. He helps him reclaim his future. He tells him that he's gonna go anoint a king that is gonna take the nation on a different path, and then he's gonna anoint A prophet, a new prophet, he's going to mentor him. Someone who will follow in his footsteps so his ministry won't die out when he does. God tells him, go and anoint Jehu, king of Israel, and anoint Elisha to replace you as my prophet. God gives him a mission, gives him a purpose, gives him a future, and that is so key Because someone here today, as you look toward your future, it looks so bleak. That's at the heart of your depression. One leading psychologist in his book, The Christian Use of Emotional Power, writes, one of the main causes of depression is a negative view of the future. And when you look at your future and you just see darkness, You can't have joy in the present when there's no hope in the future. But when you take back your future and you reclaim your future, that God has a future for me where there's hope in the future, there is joy in the present. And when you take your future and you link it to God and God says to you, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, says the Lord, and not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. And when you take your future and link it to God and you know how you have hope for the future, somebody needs to know that today. Reclaim your hope. If you're linked to God, you have a hope and you have a future. You have both of them. You may have made mistakes, but mistakes are not fatal. You may have had frustrations, but frustrations are not final. You may have had delays, but delays are not denials. God says, I will give you a hope and a future. Can somebody say amen to that? You know, the worship team's going to come out. We're winding things down. The worship team's going to come out, and uh, we're going to pray, and then we're going to sing our way toward victory. Sometimes you've got to sing your way out. But before we do, let me tell you about a time. I told you I felt depression. There are different seasons in my life I could take you to, and boy, depression was severe, really difficult. But let me talk to you just about walking through the pandemic, all of us know how hard that was. And it was hard for us as a church. It was hard for me as a pastor. It was so difficult. I mean, there were most of the time I felt very strong and courageous. But when I couldn't see our cathedral family anymore, I love our cathedral family. (laughs) And first it was two weeks, and then it was two months, and then it was two years. We were the last county in the country to reopen churches. No matter how you think about that, it was extremely hard emotionally. 
And I love our cathedral family, and I couldn't see you, and I couldn't hug you, and I couldn't care for you, and I couldn't serve you. And there were days I would just get depressed. Just being real, as I looked at the future, Cathedral would thrive for 55 years in this valley. But there were days I wondered, would we survive, let alone thrive? I can remember that first summer wondering, with my brother wondering, are we going to survive financially? And yet, some of our cathedral family stepped up that summer and gave so generously And that was such an encouragement. But I remember one moment in particular, it was a total God thing, where a lady who had been a part of our church family for a lot of years that she wanted to meet. She was in her 90s, and out of the blue, she wants to meet with Kurt and I. And we go to the meeting, and she's still, her body's frail, her mind is sharp, her eyes are still sparkling. And she says to us, you know, the church was always here for me and my late husband and what I want to do today is I I want to get the people involved that are necessary to be involved but I want to leave our estate to the cathedral and the work of the kingdom at the cathedral of faith when I die and when she said that I just I was just overwhelmed I was overwhelmed by her generosity but even more than that I was overwhelmed by the timing of God, that God could have put that on her heart anytime. He could have put it on her heart before the pandemic. He could have put it on her heart after the pandemic. But right in the first summer of the pandemic, God put it on her heart. It was God's way of saying, Ken, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give Cathedral of Faith a future and a hope. Hallelujah! And so, Cathedral, I can stand in full confidence today declaring our best days are not behind us. Our best days are still ahead of us. Hallelujah to God. Reclaim your future. Reclaim your future. Everybody stand with me, please. If you'd say, just bow your heads for a moment. I'm reclaiming my future. Say it with me. I'm reclaiming my future. We're going to sing our way to victory. Pastor Bond's going to lead us. It's what I did. I grabbed my dad, dad's, my dad's guitar and I began to sing. I'm going to see a victory. We're going to sing that same song. Before we do, though, just to bring it out of the dark and into the light, you say, Pastor Ken, I've been battling depression I've been battling discouragement when I walk through these doors. It's just been on me and in me. Would you lift up your hand real high? Say, that's right where I'm at today. Thank you, God. God sees your hands. He sees your hearts. No more in the dark. God, we're bringing it to you. Bringing that struggle to you. Pastor Vaughn, I want you to come lead us. And as we sing... I want you to begin to declare victory is headed your way. That fire is coming back. What the enemy meant for evil, God's going to turn around for good. Hallelujah. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh my God, we never fail. Sing that again. Oh my God, we never fail. We say, I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory.
want you to say this with me. The enemy's done his best, but we're still here. So I'm still here. Say that with me. I'm still here. Say it again. I'm still here. We're still here. Say it together. We're still here. Hallelujah. Yes, we are. Thanks so much for being here. Let's go out and sing in that chorus. And uh, before we do, a couple quick things. If you need prayer, our team will be here to pray with you and for you right after service. Don't be alone in your struggle. And then next week, it's a great chance to invite somebody. I'm going to wrap up the series with Elijah on being an influencer. And then Derek Deese from the Niners is going to share with us. And it's going to be a great time. So invite an unchurched friend or family member who's a football fan. Invite them out to service next week. It's going to be a lot of fun. I love our cathedral family. Amen. And we got a future and a hope. We're still here. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine brightly upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you and give you his peace. And this week, reclaim your future. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray this. All God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go. Have an awesome, awesome day.